and welcome back to the Wellness Paradox podcast. I'm so grateful that you can join us on this journey towards greater human flourishing. As always, I'm your host, Michael Stack, an exercise physiologist by training and a health entrepreneur and a health educator by trade. And I'm fascinated by a phenomena I call the wellness paradox. This paradox, as I view it, is the trust, interaction, and communication gap that exists between fitness professionals and our medical community. This podcast is all about closing off that gap by disseminating the latest, most evidence-based, and most engaging information in the health sciences. And episode 86 brings us to the end of 2022. And in this episode, I'd like to take a look back at this previous year and what we've experienced in solving the paradox. And more importantly, look forward into 2023 at the industry trends and the more macro trends that are occurring in the world and forecast out what we're going to need to do to solve the paradox in 2023. Any information I'd like to share with you from today's episode can be found on the show notes page by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode eight six. Now, when we look at the year of 2022, and I I look back of all the great minds that I've talked to in our industry, and this platform of the Wellness Paradox has really given me the opportunity to connect with so many great minds in our field, both on the air in the podcast, which you've heard, and off the air. In fact, some of the best conversations that I wish I could have recorded and played for all of you were the conversations before and after the podcast, not necessarily during the podcasts, although I think you did get a lot of great information. When I talk to these industry leaders and I start to look at what's happening just at an industry level, and that's where I'd really like to start this conversation. The first thing, and I think the biggest thing that I'm hearing from a business perspective, and also as a business owner myself experiencing this, are rising labor costs. Uh, We know that inflation has been a very real concern in the U.S. economy, and we'll talk about that when we get to some of the macro trends that I think are facing our industry and some some of the headwinds to come. But uh, just from an internal industry perspective, we have a very interesting dynamic that's occurring around labor cost, and it definitely has to be a consideration for 2023. The first consideration to the rising cost of labor in our industry is the mass exodus of professionals from our industry during the period of COVID-19. If if we look back, there were many professionals that just decided that our industry was too volatile to be involved in, and they lost their jobs at either the big box gyms, or maybe they had their own personal training practice, or maybe they had their own studio that just simply couldn't survive. So we've lost a large number of professionals, and on some level, we've probably disenfranchised other potential professionals that were looking to get into our field. And that depletes the labor force, broadly speaking. So that coexists with the fact that the the labor force in and of itself is demanding higher wages as a result of inflationary pressures. Again, this is just a economic reality of the world right now. Inflation is high, it's running seven, eight percent. And yes, hopefully it's on the, the downswing as we go into 2023. But because things are costing more, the people that are working for us simply need to make more money, which is driving up the wage that our workforce is demanding. So we have these two kind of counterbalancing you know, pressures here of we have a decreased labor pool and the people that are in that pool are asking for more money. And since there's fewer of them, they can even demand a slightly higher dollar. And the other interesting element that exists there is it's easier than it has ever been to start your own virtual fitness business. If you think back to 2016, 2017, 2018, There wasn't the tools that are available nowadays for the solopreneur fitness professional that wanted to start their own business. So if you're interested, if you're listening to this and you're interested in possibly starting your own fitness business, the the great news is there's many, many tools that are available for you right now to be able to do so. And you could also leverage the potential of doing that to drive up the demand for your labor 
with your employer. But employers, you're on the flip side of this equation. You're trying to balance the fact that you have a smaller labor pool, labor cost and wage pressures are going up. And it's also easier for individuals to be able to start their own business. So this is a, a complex economic equation, and we don't really get into economics very much on the wellness paradox. And, and I'm certainly not an economist by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I talk to my colleagues in the industry. I run a business myself, and I see this as being a, a very real concern that we have to address in 2023. So the question becomes, how do we address this concern with rising labor costs and a shrinking labor pool and that pool having the leverage to go start their own business. I think simply put, we have to provide them an opportunity in our organizations that they cannot get elsewhere. And when I think about this, I really think about it on, on three fundamental levels. Certainly pay is a consideration, but when you Consider pay in the totality of things that the current workforce, particularly the, the millennial generation, really values. Uh, wage is one element, but I would say that it is, maybe it's not the least important element, but it is not as important of a component of retaining and attracting an employee as, as much as what you may think. Where I really think we have the opportunity in 2023 and where I challenge all of you that are listening to this podcast that are business owners, managers, leaders in your business is to really think on, I think, the other two levels, which are the most important levers that we can be pulling to really attract and engage a workforce. The first is culture. And I think that culture is something that, particularly in tough economic times, uh, we tend to steer away from. We try to focus on the profit and loss statement, the balance sheet, how we how we right size our cost structures. And while all of that is certainly important and a responsibility of a business owner, I think we truly have to think in terms of how do we create a, a safe and inclusive culture for members of our team to really thrive and, and achieve their greatest potential. If we really think of it, people don't get into the fitness industry because they're looking to make millions upon millions of dollars. I think that's very evident. People get in this industry because they are service oriented. It connects with some level of higher purpose. So for all of you that are listening to this, that are in that leadership position in your business, how can you better support the people that are on your team and in cultivating their higher purpose in making their work meaningful and impactful and creating that growth promoting culture that they can't get elsewhere. Maybe you can't pay them the same top dollar that they can get doing another job. Maybe they can go out on their own and make a, a decent living doing so, but what they can't get is the development in the culture that you can create if you really care about them as a human being and you care about their development as a person and as a professional. So I think that's one challenge that I'd lay out to you in 2023 is to create such a strong culture of human development within your organization that not only do you retain the people you have, making them better, but you attract like a beacon other individuals that want to be a part of the meaningful developmental experience that you're creating for people on your team. Now, along with that, and I think it's the third point here, is the true investment in the education of your professionals. Certainly the human development side of, of, of professional growth and development is a, a critical and I think a foundational element for all businesses to focus on. But in our industry in particular, I think there is this great opportunity to really invest in the education of our professionals that work for us. So again, if you're a leader in the industry, you know, what can you give someone that they can't get on their own more than just a wage or a paycheck? And that is the, the true investment in their education could be paying for certifications. It could be offering internal education. But I think a lot of what we can really do to 
address the labor concerns that exist in our industry is actually rise above that concern and say, you know, this is not a labor issue. This isn't a labor cost issue we're talking about. This is a a human development opportunity for our industry. And I, I'd strongly encourage all of you that are in that leadership position to really operationalize helping our teams develop you know, higher purpose and become better humans, but also more evolved fitness professionals. And if you are a professional in our industry, I would strongly encourage you to seek that environment. There are so many great environments in our industry that provide that. You deserve that type of environment, particularly given the leverage you have right now in the workforce. So seek that environment out and demand that of employers and employers and leaders provide that. And that synergy really has the opportunity to truly elevate our industry. So let's set the labor cost thing aside, and, and my apologies for talking about micro and macroeconomics here on the Wellness Paradox, but it can't be ignored. We can't put our head in the sand and, and say that these labor issues don't exist, because if you don't address those properly, and we've talked about this before on the Wellness Paradox, uh, it, you know, if you're not making the appropriate amount of money, either as an individual or as a business in our industry, you have a hobby, not a job, and you can't be doing it for very long. Uh, as my good friend Doug Ribley likes to say, uh, no margin, as in no profit margin, uh, means no mission. And we certainly have to remember that. Now, when we start to look at more traditional topics for the wellness paradox, there's really four areas that I think are worthwhile diving into. And, and these are very exciting areas and they really make me feel like we are moving towards addressing the wellness paradox because some of the fundamental issues that we've addressed on this podcast with the way our industry operates, I feel like they're being addressed by these four things that I'd like to talk about. And the first one of these four, I think is a very salient discussion, particularly given some of the changes in the world coming out of the pandemic. And this is the importance of community and connection. I think we have to realize that if somebody wants to get a killer workout, that Peloton and Tonal and all of the connected fitness technologies that exist out there can provide someone a very, very good workout. In fact, maybe a better workout than what they can get in some of our facilities, particularly if we don't have uh, the kind of uh, bespoke, like uniquely individualized programs that a boutique may have. So the one thing and the one area we can always not just compete on, but we can really corner the market on is community and connection. People are craving this coming out of the pandemic. We know we're in an epidemic of of mental illness and of languishing and of desire for connection. This is what our communities can provide. So as we're going into 2023, as you're listening to this, ask yourself, what can you do to foster that sense of community and connection within your business as a fitness professional? Again, you might be an individual contributor in that business. You might be a solopreneur. You might be somebody who it leads in your own business or leads in a larger organization. What can you do to create community and connection? First with your teams, as I talked about a moment ago with being intensely involved in their human development, but also within your client and your member base. What are you doing in terms of operationalizing that community and connection? Uh, you know, culture follows structure, as, as another good friend of mine said to me recently. And what are you doing to create the structures to allow for community and connection to happen both organically and intentionally? You have that be member events and client events and just opportunities for people to connect in your lobby, maybe by bringing in coffee or smoothies. It's your job to be creative as to what works appropriately in your environment. But we are in a world where community and connection is the commodity that we are best able to provide as an industry. And I think it is something that is so lacking right now in the world. How do we provide that? Now, 
thinking kind of broadly as to some of the other trends that are happening in our industry, the thing uh, that I've been most heartened of over the past year, year and a half or so seems to be this this de-emphasis on weight loss and body composition in our industry. Now, I'm not saying this is happening uh, broadly and in all the four corners of our industry, because there certainly is a big segment of our industry that is still very body composition centric. But for the most part, I am seeing and hearing conversations around the de-emphasis of the way exercise makes you look and more of an emphasis on how it makes you feel. And that is an incredibly positive step in our industry because as much as we may think, and when I say we, I mean our industry collectively, that people exercise because they want to aesthetically look better and improve their body composition, that is a very myopic view of exercise and fitness through our own lens of why we took it up in the first place. And and I'm sure many of us started to exercise and really became motivated to be involved in this industry, in part because one of our goals was an aesthetic goal. And that's not a bad thing at all, but I think we have to realize that's not where the 80 to 85% of the people that our industry serves, that's not where they are at. They are very much about wanting to feel and function better. And I think there's no area that better encompasses that than the shift towards mental health and overall well-being that we're seeing. And yes, I think part of this is driven by necessity. We are in a mental health crisis in this country. Depression, anxiety are running rampant. The mental health community is completely overwhelmed by the volume of people that truly need their help. And they're so overwhelmed that they can't accommodate all of it. Yet we're realizing with all of the great research that is emerging and the Brick Foundation uh, for Mental Health came out with this Move Your Mental Health report this past year, which I'll link up to that in the show notes page because I think it's an amazing report. Uh, and it detailed in in very stark objective data, it detailed the role of exercise and movement in improving mental health and addressing mental illness. And I, I think we're starting to see this very salient shift towards the realization that, you know what, exercise, yeah, it might make you look better, it might make you stronger, it might make you faster, but it makes you feel better. And that's something that the American public needs now more than they've ever needed it coming out of the pandemic. You know, not only is community and connection important because it helps improve mental well-being, but the actual physiological benefits of exercise greatly drive mental well-being and address mental illness. And, and I won't get into all the, the scientific nuance of that, but just as by way of example, we know that performing exercise increases something called brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is essentially a growth factor for brain cells, which not only is very protective of mental health, but can actually address mental illness if you start to dive into some of the research. So I think going into 2023, we have to double down on this opportunity to talk about how exercise makes you feel more so than how it makes you look. Again, that may be foreign for some of us. Some of us might be thinking, hmm, like I still think a lot of people exercise because they want to look better. And what I would submit to you and really ask you to reflect on is, is that just the 15 to 20% of the population we've always been serving? And at the heart of the wellness paradox is getting to that other 80 to 85%. And I, I think there's no more powerful vehicle to doing so than talking about the mental health and mental well-being of exercise and movement. So as we go into 2023, really reflect on and then figure out how to implement a messaging strategy, a marketing campaign, narratives in and around your business, and then programming that truly helps to address the mental well-being of our population. This is our best opportunity to expand into that 80 to 85% of the market. And then lastly, 
but still going along with this theme of moving away from weight loss, because I think circuit training was a modality that was heavily marketed towards improving your weight and improving your body composition. A lot of the the marketing narrative around circuit training was about how many calories you burned and how much you were sweating during the workout and you know epoch and the afterburn and all these things that were really body composition centric. Uh, we are starting to make this shift towards strength training as an industry. And this is happening for so, so many reasons. I think probably the most prevalent reason it's happening is that the connected fitness technologies that exist, uh, particularly the home-based connected fitness technologies, they have allowed for the cardio modality to be performed very effectively in a home-based setting you can get an amazing cardiovascular workout using a lot of the connected fitness technologies that are sitting right in people's living room right now. And so there's this real question of, well, why do I need to go to the gym to hop on a treadmill when I have this connected treadmill or I have this connected bike that's sitting right in my living room or right in my basement that I can use and it can give me almost an individually curated exercise experience. Now, just to tie back really quickly to what we talked about earlier, if you can figure out a way to take that treadmill elliptical that sits in your gym and your facility and tie it to community and connection, then maybe you have something there. But if we think about it, what is the market opportunity that we can really capture from an exercise modality standpoint? It is strength training, without a doubt. And not to say that you know, connected fitness technologies like Tonal and some of the other strength training-based technologies that are, are home-based don't provide a reasonably good strength training workout because I think they do. And I think there's a lot of money that goes into the technology to provide a, an effective workout. There's no possible way that you're ever going to be able to provide the same strength training experience with home-based technology that you can with gym-based technology. It's just simply not possible. It's just the sheer number of machines and equipment, their costs, their footprint, that's never going to exist in a home-based setting for the vast, vast majority of the population. So first, I think we have a decided market advantage just on the physical space and equipment that our facilities can provide people. But more than that, strength training is something that requires some degree of expertise. I don't think anyone is concerned about the technical elements of getting on a bike or getting on a treadmill. Uh, most people believe that to be pretty intuitive, even if they haven't done it before. But strength training is something, particularly for that 80 to 85% of the population that is not engaging with us, that they are going to desire some degree of professional expertise to help them better perform, both to prevent injury and to optimize their training responses. And when you get into a lot of that 80 to 85%, the fact that they're not strength training is probably largely fear-based. There's probably a lot of fear avoidance around strength training for a lot of individuals. So this is where we, I think, have a really potent opportunity as we shift our business models away from the circuit training workouts of the you know 2015s through 2019s those that boom period for the boutiques where uh, every circuit training facility you can ever imagine popping up in your neighborhood popped up at one point i think that we've we've crested and we're on the downside of that circuit training boutique boom that we saw in the mid mid to late 2010s before the pandemic. Now strength training is king. And a lot of the research shows that some of the most highly utilized activities in health and fitness clubs are the strength training type of activities. But if we're truly going to embrace this as the business model of the future in our industry, which I think it not only should be, uh, but it absolutely can be if we're strategic about it. We also have to make sure that when we're doing so, that we welcome a population or actually a couple of populations that have not typically engaged with it. When you think of strength training in your facility, the people that are engaging with it, traditionally, that has been the male population. It's just something that men are enculturated with typically a little earlier in life. And then they, they go into those exercise habits in their adult life, where we really have the opportunity to make a, a public health impact and also an economic impact for our business is opening up strength training 
to the female demographic and the senior demographic. Those two markets are either underserved or completely not served at all in some cases by strength training type of service offerings. So the question is, how do we become strategic from a, a marketing standpoint and from a programming standpoint with how we attract that population? Huge, huge market opportunity that exists there. And I think it's an equal market opportunity between the senior population and the female population. Again, I think all of these are very positive trends. I started out with this somewhat negative industry trend of rising labor costs, which are a reality. But I think we can turn that on its head by creating the right cultures, by really emphasizing uh, a, a strong environment of human development and professional development as a true fitness professional. But we can also start to shift towards mental health, and wellness, we can continue to de-emphasize weight loss. We can focus on strength training, particularly with those key demographics of seniors and the female population. And then most importantly, we can create that community and connection in our business, which so many people absolutely crave right now. We were so well positioned to provide. Those are the, the industry trends that I'm looking at right now. And I, and I realized there was a lot there. So I'd encourage you to you know, listen, reflect, possibly re-listen to what I talked about. There's no one-size-fits-all answer to everything that we just went over in that, that industry-level analysis. But there is an answer that does work for you in whatever segment of our industry you work in. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to truly understand the trends that are emerging in our industry and ask ourselves, how can we leverage them to better address the wellness paradox in 2023? Now, I can't close this conversation without talking about some, some macro level trends. I'd consider the industry trends I talked about more, more micro level to our ecosystem. The macro level trends are trends that are affecting the entire country, if not the entire world. And they're things that we absolutely need to consider. And in the consideration, we have to ask ourselves, how can we best prepare for possibly some of the headwinds that are to come? But how can we also leverage some of the tailwinds that can really push our industry forward in the coming year? And the, the two things that I want to talk about with regard to macro level trends center around inflation, which we touched on a moment ago, uh, but also the healthcare system and what's happening, broadly speaking, from an economic perspective with healthcare, because it's a very fraught time from a healthcare perspective. First, to talk about inflation, uh, we talked about wage inflation uh, at the start of this conversation, which is a very uh, salient issue in our industry. And I laid out some possible solutions to addressing the escalating wage scale in our industry. But we also have to consider how that inflation infects, uh, affects the consumer in our industry. And I think when inflation increases, I don't believe that high touch, high dollar value services become something that dissipate and fade away. If anything, I think people start to ask in a much more critical fashion how they're spending their money, where they're spending their money, and what they're spending their money on. And so it becomes less about the cost of a given product or service during a time of, of high inflation and economic strife. And it becomes more a question of value. So looking at this, this macro trend, which definitely is a headwind that our industry is going to have to lean into in this year, we have to create so much value for the consumer that when they're doing the calculus on if they can continue to engage with our service that we're offering or not, the question that they ask themselves is not, how can I possibly afford this? But the question shifts to, how can I not afford this? And how can I figure out how to cut other things in my life to afford 
this thing is so valuable to me. So going into 2023, the way to address the headwind of inflation is to make sure you shift the value equation so much in your favor that the the question in the consumer's mind does become that transformative shift to how can I afford this to how can I not afford this? And I don't have the answer for that in your business, but what I will say to put some guardrails around it for you is really ask yourself, how are you creating value for the consumer that engages with you? And what can you do in 2023 that not just causes a small leap in value for the consumer, but causes a, a substantial leap in value for the consumer? Because if you can cause that true substantive leap in value, not only Will you retain your current customers during this period of, of macroeconomic instability? You will also start to draw consumers from other segments of the market because they are evaluating the value that they see in the services that they're being provided. And if they're not finding those service providers are meeting their needs, then, then they're going to start to look around. And if you are providing this major jump in value for your customer, you can easily provide it to other segments of the market that are not your customer, but then become your customer. Now, I don't know what a leap in value looks like for your business. And that's something that you're going to need to reflect on. But during these tough macroeconomic times and during a time period where we are very likely going into some degree of a recession in 2023. Borrowing costs are going up. Just the macroeconomic environment is becoming more harsh just on a, on a global scale. The question shouldn't be, how do we batten down the hatches? How do we cut labor costs? How do we cut programs? I think that's a very 1980s corporate America approach to macroeconomic headwinds. I think the contemporary approach, particularly for an industry such as ours, is to say, how do we double down on the value that we provide to people in our businesses? You know, what can we do? In fact, what can we do that actually provides more value but doesn't increase costs? I'd ask you to strongly reflect on that and say, you know, what is it? Or, or maybe it's not, you know, what can we add value that, that doesn't increase cost, but where can we add value that disproportionately adds value relative to the amount it's costing our business. So that could be some type of uh, program that you're running. That could be some type of you know, way you incentivize your people on your team. Whatever that strategy or series of strategies are, it all has to be around this value equation. This is not the time to drop our prices, to cut staff, and to take value away from the consumer because you're only gonna see a max exodus if that happens. This is the time to say, okay, what is my value proposition as, as a business or as an individual fitness professional in this industry? How do I expand that value proposition in a way such that the consumer sees that they're getting far more than what they're paying for and could never imagine parting ways with our service? Now, the last trend to talk about as we go into 2023, and this is a very interesting one, and I, I'm hesitant to say that I think I know where it's going because it, it's such a, a weighty, heavy issue, but I think the writing's been on a wa the wall for a while, and we're just starting to see the, the tangible manifest manifestation of it currently. It's where our healthcare system is at right now. Simply put, healthcare in America is crumbling. Uh, if you look at all of the data by any objective measure, 50% of healthcare systems in this country will lose money this year, will lose money. Now, they're subsidized by a number of things, largely the, the federal and the state governments, but healthcare is in an economic downward spiral that I don't know if they can necessarily recover from it. Whatever wage pressures we're seeing in the fitness industry, 
Uh, whatever mass exodus we've seen of professionals in the fitness industry, this is felt 10, 20, 30 fold in healthcare. And we hear about it all the time. So healthcare is in this position where their wages are going up astronomically, in some cases, 20 or 30% increases in their wages, which is not sustainable for any business, period. But healthcare is also facing the same inflationary pressures that the rest of us are facing in all the other industries. Their cost for, for actual goods are going up, their paper towel and their syringes and their gurneys and their sheets. Everything's going up at the standard inflationary amount that we're dealing with. Plus, their wages are going up disproportionately more than nearly any other industry that I can think of right now. And, and this is the rub, and their reimbursements are going down. That is, I think, the most salient concern for healthcare is they could possibly absorb these inflationary costs if their reimbursements were keeping pace, but they're simply not. And reimbursements have been going down for a very, very long time in healthcare, but now they're at this incredibly precarious point where their reimbursements are continuing to go down but their costs are exponentially increasing. And that is simply an unsustainable economic equation. I believe 2023 will be the true inflection point for healthcare where they start to strongly and swiftly shift from the volume-based care that they've been providing to value-based care. And part of value-based care means being able to provide better health outcomes for lower amounts of money. And this is where the wellness paradox comes in. And this is where we come in as fitness and exercise professionals. We have the ability to shift dramatically that volume to value-based transition by figuring out how to interact with medical professionals, how to provide evidence-based outcome-driving programs for their patients, and how to actually become part of the healthcare ecosystem. So the conditions, the environmental conditions to become part of the healthcare delivery system exist more in 2023 than they ever have. And, and we have all of these economic pressures to be able to, to thank for that. And I choose to look at what's happening from an economic perspective as a real opportunity for our industry because it is dramatically affecting healthcare. And you hear it over and over and over again if you look at any of the information on healthcare economics or any of just the contemporary news stories on healthcare. And this is the year. So I think we really need to triple down, not double down, triple down, quadruple down, however you want to frame it on how we develop relationships with healthcare and how we show them that we can provide evidence-based outcome-oriented programs that help make their patient population healthier. Because if we do that, that will actually cause them to make more money. That will actually be able to start to shift that economic equation where costs are going up and reimbursements are going down to, okay, costs don't have to go up as much because I make people healthier, which requires less labor and fewer supplies. And because we're shifting from volume-based care to value-based care, meaning outcomes-based care, you get somebody healthier faster as a health system or as an individual healthcare professional, you're simply going to make more money. So we have the opportunity in 2023 to lay the groundwork to begin to save the healthcare delivery system in our country. We're in an incredibly powerful position right now. We have a lot of leverage on our side because of it, and we absolutely cannot forget it. So that's 2022 into 2023 uh, by way of a summary conversation. A, a lot to think about there. I realized that you know, this was kind of a, a brain dump on my part from you in this episode. Uh, and I think it's it's important for you to realize that you don't need to boil the ocean on uh, this conversation that we just had. Find one, maybe two things that resonate with you in what I talked about and ask yourself, how can I take that, 
reflect on it, understand it, and then operationalize it in my business or as a professional in this industry going into 2023 to make a meaningful difference in population health, but also make your business financially stronger going into the next year. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I hope you've enjoyed our time together in 2022. Uh, going into 2023, we're going to have one significant change to the wellness paradox. Uh, we are going to be publishing bi-weekly episodes rather than weekly episodes. Uh, one of my goals here is to spend more time cultivating relationships with the professionals in our industry uh, to bring them to you, our audience, in these conversations. Uh, one of the challenges that I find that I run into is spending so much time recording podcasts means I can't devote as much time as what I'd like to sourcing and developing relationships with guests that I feel can be truly, truly valuable for you. So we will be bi-weekly starting in 2023, but bringing you the same cutting edge content that truly addresses the wellness paradox. And we'll also be looking to bring you some bonus content here and there through 2023. So even though our schedule will be bi-weekly, I do suspect here or there as things arise, we'll be having some conversations in between those bi-weekly episodes. Being 86 episodes into this I, and you know a year and a half in, I can't tell you how grateful I am to all of you as an audience, our listeners for really pushing me to explore the paradox further and become a, a better human and a better professional myself in the field. And I am every bit as dedicated going into 2023 to solving the paradox as I've ever been. And I can't wait to continue to bring you these dynamic and informative conversations to help you on your crusade along with me to solve the wellness paradox. Any information I'd like to share with you from today's episode can be found on the show notes page by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode 86. I hope everyone is having an amazing holiday season and I wish you the happiest of New Year's. We'll chat again in 2023. Until then, please be well. <laughs>